Hey friends, welcome back to Identifying Cloud Service Architectures. In our last lesson, we started talking about the idea of breaking applications apart into their components and then distributing those components, thereby allowing them to work kind of autonomously from one another, grow and be provisioned and built and managed separate from one another. But it also introduced another concern, the idea that we could talk between these different systems. And this opens up a wide array of problems around how to exchange messages, having an interface for it, and then understanding some sort of rules around the way that we'll actually exchange data. <laughs> and so cloud service providers who are really leveraging a lot of microservices in the background to deliver their products, they also have those same problems. And in this lesson, we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about the idea of event-driven behavior and how this helps improve autonomous systems and the ability to interoperate in a standardized format. So kind of jumping back into where we were earlier on, what we're focusing on right now is this particular layer right here. You have microservice to your environment. You've got it all distributed because you've got them web scale targets that you're trying to hit. <laughs> and you're considering how exactly to exchange information back and forth. Well, one of the first things to recognize is that we need an interface. And for a lot of uh, applications, this is going to come through the notion of an API or an application programming interface. It literally contains the word interface in it. <laughs> so it's a pretty good starting point. But the mechanism behind it is ultimately using a really standardized protocol, and that would be the hypertext transfer protocol. So by using APIs on our different web services and using a standard way of talking to them with HTTP, it provides us at least one of the first concerns we have, which is how do we actually get the two systems to talk to one another? After that, we then have to kind of consider what does the data look like inside of it? Because ultimately that was the whole point of the interfacing problem. <laughs> we got to exchange information. And so for a lot of organizations, this means considering the syntax of the data itself. What do we include? What structure is it in? Is it in XML, extensible markup language? Are we using JavaScript to exchange it or using some other clear text mechanism to exchange it? And so for us, um, with a lot of service providers, one of the key tricks that they'll use is a standardized event protocol or an event syntax. And ultimately what they're just trying to do here is standardize the shape and the formatting of the data so that when one system sends it to the other, they don't have to relearn all the mechanisms that are happening in the background. And this is really relevant. Let's actually take a look over here on the web. And if we take a look for Azure event schema, it should find us a link to what we're looking for. Yeah, okay, perfect, this one right here. Cruise on down in and you can see a version of the JavaScript uh, formatted event itself. And take a look at all the components. There's a topic, a subject, a unique identifier, event date and time information. And then there's also payloads that can be included as well. And so what this normalized syntax does is help remove some of the guessing between how different components might interoperate. <laughs> and remember earlier on, I was telling you that a part of the value here is being able to autonomously develop and support these components separate from one another. This is a lot easier when we have a standardized way of exchanging messages between them. Um, and keep in mind, your friends, that as you get out into cloud architectures, event, message, those are fairly interchangeable concepts. It really just depends on what systems are exchanging them. One might call it an event and they send a message as a part of the event. Others might say that they're using messaging and it contains event info. <laughs> These are fairly synonymous concepts. On top of that, if we take a look over in the vendors themselves, if you get into Azure and take a look for event, Okay, you'll see they have Event Hub and Event Grid. These are systems that actually allow you to relay events, not just within your application, but also between other Azure services out there. Keeping in mind that Azure is built on uh, distributed architecture and all of their components generate events between one another and they can share a lot of that event data with you as well. So this means that not only are you keying off of events in your applications, but you can look at events that are happening in the cloud service providers environments as well. Boom, <laughs> very exciting. Similarly, if you take a look over here at AWS, and look for event, you'll see they have event bridge. And event bridge is designed as another conveying service. It allows you to hook applications together and relay messages back and forth between one another. There's a way of discovering events and looking at uh, what's available for Relay. And there's also the ability for you as an application developer to put events onto those buses as well. And so kind of getting back to our original architecture, when we're talking about how to exchange data between microservice components, we said there were really two big concerns. The first one was around the interface. And so we said by using a standard protocol like HTTP and APIs, this normalizes how to send the messages. And then we talked about using events as a part of the um, data itself that's moving in the background. And that gave us a standardized syntax. 
One of the final principles that this drives them is uh, really considering what those events might contain and how you might react to them. A good principle behind this is being able to automate actions based on sort of events that are happening in your environment. So a really common one that I work with a lot of customers on is identity-based events. So BART logs in at this particular time and it generates an event that causes somebody to be notified that an administrator is now making changes in an environment. And that's a really simple example. Another one might be if you actually have maybe a networking device. Something has gone down. It can send an event onto some sort of messaging system, whether that be something you built or something the providers are offering, like we just looked at with AWS and Azure, and then have one of your systems listening for those events. Oh, what? What's that? What? Oh, here comes trouble. <laughs> so then it can go and look at the data in it, respond right back to it, and take action on it. One final example, uh, very AWS centric, here at CBT Nuggets, when I create a piece of video content, like what you're watching right now, I upload it into a storage service at AWS and it generates an event when that action occurs. So uh, the CBT Nuggets developers have written a little listener that looks for that event. The event tells it where that file is and who uploaded it. And then they go and they process it and they make it ready for you to go and consume, just like you're watching right now. And so in the end, friends, by using event-driven architectures, we can create all sorts of fantastic interactions between our distributed web components, as well as looking at ways to automate the management of our infrastructure. These are really powerful concepts that cloud service providers use to deliver their services and often are able to extend to us as consumers of those services. And all of these patterns are very important when we start looking at how modern cloud applications can be developed to work and interoperate. And again, go back to that goal we were talking about earlier, hitting those web scale targets. So hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing.